Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Australia's oldest parliament, the Mother Parliament of Australia, and to one of the oldest buildings still in working condition in Australia. Tonight I've left the room, the door open to the parks room, so when you leave, you might like to just go in there and have a look. There's a glass uh, a panel and you can see into the room and see the original convict substrate of the building. It's absolutely fascinating. There's some conservation work going on in there at the moment. Um, now, before we begin this evening, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal of Eora, and I thank them for looking after country for thousands of years. I acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging. I also welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be here today, but I also welcome people of all cultures. Stan Grant Jr. reminds us that Australia is founded on four great traditions, Aboriginal histories and cultures, Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, British colonists' histories and cultures, and our rich migrant heritage. I just need to let you know that tonight our friend Daniel down the back is filming, but he won't capture your faces. He's filming our speaker tonight, and this recording will be available on our webpage next week. Um, that's how we reach out to our regional uh, participants, and these programs are really sort of um, a way of connecting the parliament to the people across the state. Um, I would like to now introduce the Honourable Jonathan O'Day, the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly and the Member for Davidson to open our event tonight. Thank you so much, Megan, and uh, wonderful to welcome you all here and those who are joining us online. Uh, can I also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and it is uh, important acknowledging country in this parliament as we do every sitting day, uh, and it helps us break down barriers, build trust across communities, and acknowledge that very important part of our common uh, heritage and, and history in Australia. Um, can I also um, just acknowledge um, the, uh, those who've organised tonight's event in particular from our communication, education and engagement team um, and, uh, and just say what a great job that they're doing to try and increase that level of engagement and education with the community. There's a number of events, uh, including uh, a festival of democracy has just been celebrated and uh, you know, websites that are being enhanced, a whole lot of measures that the parliament's taken very consciously to increase that level of engagement and thank you for being part of, of tonight's house talk, the second house talk for the year. Uh, this program is a series of virtual and live events that have organised, as I said, by the education and engagement team, featuring experts and special guests speaking on historical and cultural topics that relate to the history and functions of the New South Wales Parliament and Legislature and our state generally. And tonight we're meeting in the Jubilee Room. Uh, it is a historic uh, building and it's, uh, it's a beautiful room here. Uh, and and uh, it was designed by the government architect, Walter Liberty Vernon, uh, who lived from 1846 to 1914. And he uh, also designed the Art Gallery, Admiralty House in Kirribilli, and the Australian Museum. And the room was built to commemorate the 50-year anniversary of a responsible government in New South Wales, which was granted in 1856. So for those who can do a little bit of maths, say 1906. Um, and certainly um, it served, um, as you could probably gather, as a parliamentary library at one stage, in fact, from 1906 to 1980. But now the books uh, which you see around the room are, um, are a little bit different. They're all Hansard records from both the Legislative Council and the Legislative Assembly. Uh, those uh, books you can see have, have binding uh, colours and uh, they denote the chamber that 
the, the Hansard record comes from, green from the Legislative Assembly and red for the Legislative Council. And you'll see those, those colours predominantly in those chambers taken from the, from the British tradition. Um, this room is, um, it's in fact, it's my favourite room uh, in the Parliament. It's now used for committee meetings, um, some functions, uh, and indeed events like this in terms of uh, engaging and educating. Um, and uh, an essential feature of the room is, of course, the stained glass window, which um, you can see above you. If you haven't read uh, that little uh, phrase at the top there in the circular, uh, in the head of the Minerva, the, uh, the goddess of wisdom, um, it's, uh, uh, it, it conveys the following words, knowledge is the mother of wisdom and virtue. And you can also see the floral emblems of the Rose of England, the Thistle of Scotland, and the Clover of Ireland, which hark back to the origins of the colony. And for those who are looking online, um, you can look on the website, you'll see that beautiful image. Uh, it's therefore more than fitting to the original purpose of this room to host our house talks in the room tonight. And our speaker this evening is Dr. Catherine Fisher. Welcome, Catherine, and thank you. Um, Catherine's a historian and a policy advisor who holds a PhD from the School of History at the Australian National University. And Dr. Fisher's publications include her first book, Sound Citizens, Australian Women Broadcasters Claim Their Voice, 1923 to 1956, which was published in 2021. Uh, Catherine also co-edited Expressions of War in Australia and the Pacific, Language, Trauma, Memory and Ass Official Discourse, which was published in 2020. Uh, Dr Catherine Fisher is going to speak tonight about how radio provided a platform for women to contribute to public discourse and normalised the presence of women's voices in the public sphere. She will examine how early federal, um, sorry, early female parliamentarians included, um, in, including uh, people in, in this place, I have no doubt. These days we're a little bit more normalised, thankfully, but, um, but it also wasn't always so, and, and certainly how uh, some of those early female parliamentarians used broadcasting to shape their engagement uh, was very important. Um, and that engagement obviously uh, was with the electorate, um, both their, some of them, their local electorates, but the broader electorate, and also um, helped develop their public profiles in a broader sense. So um, I'm delighted that Dr. Catherine Fisher is with us this evening. And I'd like you to join with me now in giving her a very warm welcome to address us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I might maybe lower this a little bit, actually. Um, and thank you as well to Megan and her team for inviting me to speak today. I can't believe I'm in this beautiful room addressing you all. Um, I was also reflecting on my way here about how fortuitous um, it is. I'm not sure if you had inside knowledge about the date of the federal election, but the fact that I'm addressing you in the middle of an election campaign, given we're um, talking I'll be talking today mostly about um, the first two women in federal parliament and how they use radio. Um, and so you'll, you'll get, I guess, a bit of a different sense of how people, uh, parliamentarians, used to do election campaigns in the 1940s. Um, it's a little bit different to how we do it today. So it might be a nice change of pace. So in 1954, Dame Enid Lyons, looking fabulous up there. Um, she's the first woman elected to the House of Representatives. Um, she remarked in an interview with magazine the ABC Weekly that radio had created a bigger revolution in the life of a woman than anything that has happened at any time. It's a pretty big deal. It en enabled women to engage with world affairs while doing the housework. Um, and according to Lyons, radio um, gave women the confidence to accept responsibility in public affairs. And this resulted in a marked improvement in women's social and political standing. This is a pretty big thing to say, I think, about radio. Um, 
it indicates the importance of radio in the history of women's political and social advancement in Australia. Uh, and in the research that I did for my book, Sound Citizens, I, I found that there's a, actually a, a quite a big cohort of women in this period, the kind of 1920s to 1940s, 1950s, um, who used radio um, to contribute to the public sphere um, and improve women's status in Australia. Um, the book, um, it traces the changing role of radio as a tool for women's activism as well as its um, wider significance for the history of women's advancement in Australia more broadly. Uh, Australian women broadcasters were active citizens who contributed to, the, to public debates on a range of issues. Um, they worked to educate and empower their listeners. Um, and they normalised the presence of women's voices in the public sphere, both literally and figuratively. While women broadcasters were often given roles and time slots and programs that continued to perpetuate women's lowered status in the workplace and public life, so think kind of women's sessions that you probably, you might know about already, um, many of these broadcasters recognised the potential of radio as a medium um, and used it to advance women's status by strengthening their claims to a public voice. Women's equality um, requires real cultural change, which includes the opportunity for women to be heard and have a chance to influence society. Radio, first introduced to Australia in 1923, provided a platform for Australian women to speak and be heard in public on a scale not previously experienced. Furthermore, radio bridged the public and private spheres as it was a public medium heard primarily within a domestic setting within the home and women made up the majority of its listeners, especially during the day. The ability to reach a large, diffuse audience of female listeners made the medium especially suited to advancing women's position by providing them with a tool to integrate themselves into the public sphere. Women's use of radio to spread their messages and to speak directly to a large audience of other women was key to the legitimation of feminism as a political movement as well as legi the legitimation of women's voices in the public sphere and informal politics. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the significance of broadcasting to the political careers of the first two women elected to a federal parliament, so it's Dame Enid Lyons and Dame Dorothy Tangney, who were both elected at the 1943 federal election. Um, I'll first cover a bit of an overview of women's broadcasting um, and a bit of background on the role of radio in Australian politics at that time more generally, um, and the early history of women in Australian politics, um, both federally and also in this place and um, other state legislatures across Australia. I'll then um, go through some of Lyons and Tang's broadcasts um, during 1943, 1946 and 1949 elections, um, as this was when women were finally successful at achieving federal representation and the use of radio appeal to appeal to voters really matured in Australia during these years. Um, and hopefully if the sound works, we'll have an opportunity to hear them both as well. So women's radio programming has largely been presented as reinforcing domesticity um, and restricting women's roles to those of wife, mother and homemaker. Um, so women's sessions, um, while they did certainly devote airtime to talks on things like mothercraft, uh, cookery, homemaking, fashion, beauty, all those kind of stereotypical feminine activities you would think of. Um, I have found in my research that this assessment of women's sessions as solely reinforcing domestic ideals of womanhood actually neglects um, that they provided, uh, provided platforms for various women and some men as well um, to speak on a, a quite a wide variety of topics. Um, so in these sessions you get quite political topics sometimes. There are women in these sessions who know how to use radio um, to advocate for change in particular areas that they're passionate about. And because women's sessions perhaps don't get as much attention from um, maybe government and media and things like that, they're kind of seen as not being very important. Um, some of these women were able to, I think, get away with a bit more than they would have if they were on, say, primetime programming. It's also, I think, you know, really important just to remember that women were actually active participants in radio's education of new citizens in the interwar years. Um, and this was on both the ABC um, and also on the commercial stations. The fact that radio is a sonic medium that you listen to um, makes it especially significant for women's advancement as it normalised the sound of women's voices in the public sphere. 
while there were criticisms, um, you know, in media and, and elsewhere that women's voices on radio were shrill or they lacked authority, um, I think that these criticisms were often part of a more nuanced discourse of appropriate radio speech, which was closely linked to changing notions of Australian identity, um, particularly in terms of the creeping Americanization of Australian culture at the time. There's a kind of moral panic about um, American, especially with the talkies and movies and things like that, and the influence that was having on Australian identity. Um, and women's voices on the air were criticised by those who believed that there was a decline of spoken English in Australia more generally at that period. Um, and they were by no means the sole target of listeners I are. Men as well were the targets of this. Um, and if women could um, exhibit good radio speech, um, if they could speak in a cultivated accent and um, conform to high standards of elocution, um, they could use radio to disseminate their ideas, experiences and agendas to a receptive audience, um, both male and female. So a pleasant speaking voice um, could therefore help them engage in public discourse and have their place taken more seriously. Radio's significance as a tool that aided the development of women's citizenship was due to a confluence of several factors, which revealed that the medium both reflected broader changes in the mid 20th century and drove change itself. Firstly, the birth of the medium was a key technology of modernity, which transformed communications and media. Its status as a new cutting edge technology meant that it was well positioned to challenge the status quo of the gendered soundscape. And indeed by giving regular airtime to women, radio stations provided a new space for them to contribute to public discourse. Secondly, radio's time as the dominant broadcast medium was a period of profound social and political shifts. Coming so soon after the end of World War I, the advent of radio characterised the hope for a modern future. However, the onset of the Great Depression from 1929, coupled with the rise of fascism and increasing geopolitical strife that led to World War II, um, this era is, is really a, a uh, one of profound instability. And it's also one that saw significant change to women's status in Australia. White women's participation in domestic service and home-based economies had declined in the late 19th century, and they increasingly worked in places like manufacturing, retail and service industries, uh, professions like teaching and nursing, and office work from sort of the 1920s onwards. The trend of women's increased participation in the workforce continued over the 20th century, including spikes in workforce participation during the First and Second World Wars. Women also claim, claimed greater social and sexual freedoms in this period. The flapper of the 1920s was associated with consumerism, feminine beauty and sports, um, and a visible sexuality. Um, and World War II was a period of sexual exploration for many young women who became involved with visiting American servicemen. Many women travelled um, as well during this period, um, often to Britain, but also to Europe more broadly, the United States and even to Asia in some cases. Um, they undertook a wide range of political activity. Um, it, the interwar period was particularly characterised by the dominance of large women's organisations. I think the CWA has just celebrated 100 years, so that's obviously one, but there's, there was so many, there were a lot. Um, and these organisations promoted a largely non-party approach to politics that emphasised the commonality of women's experience um, and structured their political demands accordingly. Women also began to be elected to parliament, first in small numbers, numbers in state legislatures and then in 1943 to the federal parliament. Um, and by the 1960s and the advent of the women's liberation movement, um, equality with men in the public sphere had become a central focus of feminist demands. Um, from Mel Thornton and Rosalie Bognor chaining themselves to the front bar of the Regatta Hotel um, to campaigns against discriminatory hiring practices and abortion restrictions. So within this kind of changing um, focus and shifting, um, yeah, shifting focus of Australian feminism, radio provided another change to women's status as a new platform from which women could articulate their viewpoints. The regular presence of female voices on the airways, um, while often located in time slots and programs specifically delineated for that purpose, was a notable, notable development that differentiated radio from print media. And radio's focus on the sound of the voice made it a more intimate medium and listeners regularly identified radio voices as central to successful broadcasts. Skilled broadcasters relied on their radio speech to connect with their audiences and present a persuasive message. 
one of the major contributions of broadcasting to women's advancement, um, again, was its ability to normalise the sound of the voices. Um, and the advent of radio enabled women to speak publicly on a daily basis. Like, the, the amount of women speaking on, in public that you were able to hear from radio's um, launch was just so much more than you would have been able to hear before that. It's, it's a big deal. So while the airtime given to women's voices was far less than given to men, you know, that, that is a fact, um, it should still be recognised that their roles on the air enabled them to speak for themselves. Um, and because of this, as um, a writer named Muriel Such argued in 1934, radio played a not unimportant part in feminine emancipation. By the start of World War II, radio had become an important tool for politicians seeking to communicate with the broadest possible audience of voters. During the Lyons Prime Ministership in the 1930s, both Joseph Lyons um, and his wife Enid made extensive use of the medium, um, and Enid continued to regularly appear on the airwaves after her husband's death in 1939. Um, in 1937, Labour leader John Curtin decided to broadcast his election policy speech from Perth, after realising that radio had superseded local meetings as the best method of communication with the electorate. Um, the Country Party similarly broadcast a series of question and answer sessions on regional New South Wales stations during the 1937 election. Um, and even the Communist Party um, used radio to communicate with their supporters. Um, CPA member Frida Brown was known as the voice of the people in her weekly broadcasts on Labor Station 2KY in the 1940s. Radio's importance to Australian politics grew even greater during World War II. Prime Minister Robert Menzies gave his now famous declaration of war via radio broadcast in 1939, uh, using grandiose and statesmanlike language and his thick and low voice. Um, Menzies' English, um, unsurprisingly, was a refined and reminiscent of a time when the British Empire lived on in the voices of the Australian people. In 1941, Prime Minister John Curtin also used radio to announce war with Japan, um, but his voice was a bit different. It provided a clear counterpoint to the refinement of Menzies. Um, Curtin had an unmistakably Australian accent, which contrasted to the English or, or near English accents which predominated on the airwaves at that time. Um, so Menzies on one hand vocally represented empire loyalty, um, while Curtin on the other represented more of the voice of the common people, as you would expect perhaps from a, a Labor Prime Minister. After the um, United Australia Party, which became the Liberal Party's departure from office in 1941, um, Menzies then turned to radio to remain publicly visible um, and to begin to change the minds of the electorate following his party's defeat. Um, notably, he believed that any relevant politician should make use of both commercial stations and the ABC, and he began a series of radio talks in January 1942, which included the famous Forgotten People broadcast, made on 22 May 1942. In this broadcast, which is uh, still, I think, you know, influences our political discourse today, um, he promoted the Australian middle class as the backbone of the nation, um, yet a majority so often overlooked in policy decisions. Um, he articulated the political vision that would come to define the Menzies era, um, and that the forgotten people is so closely, still so closely tied with the Menzies prime ministership, um, attests, I think, you know, to the strong power of radio at this time. This series of talks that he did um, also marked the beginning of the revival of a non-Labour morale, um, and the construction of a forward-looking image for both the United Australia Party and Menzies himself, um, although there would still be many years to go before he was eventually successful again in the 1949 election. Judith Brett has also argued that Menzies specifically spoke to women through these broadcasts. Um, his rhetorical focus on the home as the centre of middle-class life um, made room for women's experiences in public debate. And... This was in contrast to the ALP, um, who tended to focus on primarily male experiences of the workplace and industrial relations. Um, it is important to recognise the fact that The Forgotten People was first given as a radio talk, I think, um, as women were a primary audience for radio and its status as a medium which blurred the public and private spheres provided a space for women to enact active citizenship. Menzies helped to legitimise the role that radio, of radio as a political tool that could be used to reach women effectively. Within the context of the increasing use of radio to appeal to the voting public, 
the female candidates in the 1943, 46 and 49 elections made use of the medium to appeal specifically to female voters. Speaking directly to women through the airways further emphasised the role of radio as a medium through which women could claim their voices as citizens in Australia at this time. In this period, most party publicity usually appeared to be addressed either to a man or an archetypal voter who was assumed to be a man. Um, the presence of women, though, in Australian Federal Parliament from 1943 onwards marked a, a major shift in the major, part, in the major parties towards conceptualising women as political citizenship, citizens. Um, and during the 1943 election campaign, um, where there's a lot more women and um, where women were eventually elected, um, Mendes and Curtin even took the unusual step of responding to questions from the Australian Women's Weekly, um, which was a very rare occurrence for male political leaders at this time, but yet shows that women were starting to be considered as important voters and important, um, yeah, having a political voice. So although women famously won the federal franchise and the right to stand for federal parliament in 1902, very early by global standards, um, it was not until 1943 that the first women were finally elected to federal parliament. Um, many women had stood as political candidates um, and state legislatures had seen some, albeit limited, progress in female representation. Um, so 1921, Edith Cowan became the first female parliamentarian when she was elected to the parliament of Western Australia. Um, and she was followed in that um, place by Labor candidate May Holman in 1925. Um, Millicent Preston Stanley was elected as a Nationalist MP in the Parliament of New South Wales in 1925. Um, Irene Longwin in Queensland Lower House in 1929 and Ivy Webber was elected as an Independent MP in Victoria in 1937. In December 1943, geologist Kathleen Sherrard wrote an article which explored the reasons for the lack of women in both state and federal parliaments. And she observed the relative ease with which women won the vote, because of the relative ease with which women won the vote in Australia, meant that they had not been stirred by a long struggle like women in other countries like Britain, for example. And there were, Australian women were therefore not eager to vote women into office. However, for Sherard, the major reason for this was that women were absent in other posts of authorities like councils, juries, um, magistrates, benches, um, and few women were connected with power, powerful industry and business groups. They just weren't women in the public sphere. They weren't visible. As a result, she argued, women were unknown to voters and were inclined to um, elect, who were inclined to elect candidates which fit the status quo, so men. Marion Sawyer and Marion Sims have also observed the reluctance of the major parties to endorse women. Um, and the converse problem that the majority of women who were elected in these early years were endorsed by the major parties. Although there were a number of women who stood as independents, um, they usually had little electoral success. The 1943 election approved to be a watershed for a number of reasons. Marilyn Lake has argued that women's lack of representation in federal parliament became um, an increasingly obvious denial of their equal rights as citizens, um, particularly within the context of the significant increase um, in women in the paid workforce between 1939 and 43 due to the participation due to World War II. Um, furthermore, by this point, the election of women to federal parliament was no longer just a necessity for women's public citizenship, um, but a potential career option for women that was being denied for them. And as a result, the 1943 election saw a renewed push by feminists um, to gain parliamentary representation through the Women for Canberra movement, which supported and trained women to stand for election. 19 independent candidates were sponsored by this movement, including the movement's leader, Ivy Webber, who had resigned her seat in the Parliament of Victoria to run. Although none of the women for Can Canberra candidates were ultimately elected, um, the movement brought more broadly provided um, an impetus for renewed scrutiny on the lack of female representatives. Um, and this kind of focus, I think, um, helped deliver the first two women who are up there um, to federal parliament. Enid Lyons, UAP, which is later the Liberal Party member for the Tasmanian seat of Darwin, and Dorothy Tangney, ALP Senator for Western Australia. Lyons was reportedly convinced by her daughter to run in the seat of Darwin. Um, and on paper, it would seem like she was an ideal candidate. Um, she was the widow of a former Prime Minister. 
a party elder, a well-regarded public figure in her own right, especially in her home state of Tasmania. Um, but yet the UAP actually ran two other candidates in her electorate, uh, which indicates that there was still a significant amount of unease about a female candidate, even one with the standing of Damien in Lyons. If you really you couldn't get a better candidate than her. Um, despite the fact that her own party ran two other candidates in her electorate, um, she won the seat um, and went on to successfully contest the 1946 and 49 elections. Um, in 1949, she was appointed Vice President of the Executive Council in the newly elected Menzies Liberal Government, uh, which made her the first woman in Federal Cabinet. Um, in 1951, uh, she resigned from Parliament in poor health. Tangney's election was um, not assured. Uh, she was placed fourth on the Senate ticket um, and probably wouldn't have been elected if not for the landslide swing to the ALP at the 1943 election. But in the years following her election, uh, Tangney proved to be a popular representative amongst voters and she headed the WA Senate ticket um, at the 46, 51, 55 and 61 elections. Um, in 1967, however, after a change in procedure giving the all-male state executive control over the Senate ticket, she was placed fourth and was not elected. Um, indeed, it appears that the ALP was especially uneasy with running female candidates in this period, um, and Lyons later noted that Tangney didn't receive the respect she deserved in her party room. So, I'll talk a little bit about um, Dame Enid, and then we'll move on to Dorothy. Um, so, Enid Lyons began broadcasting in the early 1920s, um, when her husband, Joseph, was education minister in the Tasmanian Labor government. Um, she then continued to be a frequent platform speaker and broadcaster during Joe's political career, which saw him become Labor Premier of Tasmania in 1923. And then after moving to federal politics and defecting to the United Australia Party um, in 1931, um, he was Prime Minister of Australia from 1932 until his death in office in 1939. The Lionses were regular fixtures on Australian radio in the 1930s, and their radio talks became a central plank of their political strategy. Through radio, the Lionses were able to present themselves as an everyday family, sharing both the day-to-day -day struggles of the Depression and the simple joys of family li life. Um, they had 12 children, 11 of whom survived to adulthood. She continued broadcasting um, after her husband's death um, and, unsurprisingly, made extensive use of radio during her campaign for election. Lyons' strong public image meant that her suitability for public office was well recognised long before she even decided to stand for election. Um, in January 1940, for example, um, on the, quote, 152nd anniversary of being ruled by men, the Australian Women's Weekly published an article nominating who they would like to see make up a government run by women. Lyons was selected as the ideal Prime Minister and was described as a gifted speaker and broadcaster, poised yet homely. The direct mention of Lyons' skills as a speaker and broadcaster indicates the importance that was afforded to them as important requisites for the position. In 1944, um, the ABC invited both Lyons and Tangney um, into their studios to record their maiden speeches, which were originally given in September 1943. Um, the recordings of both speeches have been preserved um, and were added to the National Film and Sound Archive Sounds of Australia Registry in 2011. Um, the recording of Lyons in particular, I think, is an excellent surviving example of her radio speech that demonstrates how the sound of her voice interacted with her words to produce a kind of sonic ideal of the female parliamentarian. So I'm going to hopefully be able to play it for you. Just the first 30 seconds or so. It would be strange indeed were I not tonight deeply conscious of the fact and not a little awed by the knowledge that on my shoulders rests a great weight of responsibility. Because this is the first occasion upon which a woman has addressed this house. Um, so you can listen to the speech in full if you just kind of Google Damien and Lyons maiden speech, National Film and Sound Archive, it should come up and you can have a listen. It's a lovely speech. He speaks beautifully. Um, you don't hear voices like that anymore, I don't think. 
Lyons um, <clears throat> sought to emphasise her femininity throughout her political career um, and that she was kind of in Parliament um, particularly to represent women. Throughout her maiden speech, um, she made many references to kind of topics to do with women, um, including child endowment um, and the importance of motherhood. Um, she emphasised her own expertise as a woman, a wife and a mother, um, and intimated that these new perspectives that she was bringing um, would be useful to political decision making. Um, and so she made references to her being like a, a new broom sweeping through the parliament. Um, yet she also deferred to the expertise of male colleagues and hoped that they might help her in a chivalrous manner. Um, notably, she also directly addressed um, the concerns of her colleagues about the entrance of a woman to parliament um, and sought to alleviate them by assuring her colleagues that she intended to behave in a modest fashion. Um, Lyons employed particular vocal styles that you can hear in the recording um, that worked to emphasise her kind of maternal femininity um, and differentiate herself from male MPs. Um, so in the recording, she uses kind of a moderately high pitch. It's a very cultivated accent. You don't hear them really anymore. Um, she used elocution techniques that really defined her broadcasting style. Um, and this kind of intellectual refinement um, that defined this ideal of genteel femininity of, at that time um, was really quite closely associated with the voice um, and particularly the cultivation of this balanced, quite melodious style of speaking. Um, elocution as well has been often seen as a feminine activity due to its kind of superficiality. Um, but like many other superficial or cosmetic practices, um, it was made normative for women, at least a certain class of women at this time. Um, Lyons received elocution training as a child. Um, she performed in elocution competitions. Um, and by speaking in this cultivated star, style developed um, through her elocution training, um, she conformed to these ideals of vocal femininity. Indeed, her cultivated vocal delivery was an important focus for much of the media commentary of this speech. Um, the Adelaide Advertiser described her as speaking with great emotion and clarity of voice. The Bernie Advocate described her as an attractive speaker. And the Sydney Morning Herald stated that she spoke clearly and fluently. In her autobiography, Lyons herself described how the press was unanimous in praise of her oratory and mentions one report which praised her control of inflection and phrasing. I just can't imagine anybody in Parliament who would be... <laughs> who those words would be um, used about. So it's, it's very interesting. Um, Lyon's style of speaking, um, influenced by elocution training, was really um, crucial to her performance of femininity. Um, and this radio broadcast, um, which was done after, um, would have aimed to capture the vocal quality that was considered to be such a feature of the original speech. Perhaps unsurprisingly, and certainly foreshadowed in her maiden speech, um, Lyons' place in Parliament was largely defined by her maternal femininity. During the first half of the 20th century, um, this kind of concept of maternal citizenship was developed, which promoted white Australian women as the mothers of the race, who, would, who should have citizenship rights bestowed to them on that basis. So motherhood um, was promoted as a service to the state that was equal to men's paid work. Um, and white women's value to the nation lay in their capacity to rear children. Compared with her male counterparts, um, Lyons was represented as an abnormal figure in politics due to the press focus on her status as a wife and mother. Her radio broadcast during the Great Depression years of her husband's prime ministership cast her as a mother to the nation, a role which she would continue to embody for many, many years. During her own political career, she drew on maternalist discourses when articulating um, kind of rhetoric and her policy positions. Um, it was a common refrain that Lyons would bring a motherly approach to cabinet when she was made vice president of the executive council. Um, and her, her citizenship and political position was really dependent on her contribution to the state as a mother. Um, and both she and the media emphasized that point. Lyons' political rhetoric exhibited this notion of maternal citizenship through her promotion of the importance of the mother, um, support for child endowment, um, and the role of the state in supporting the family unit. Lyons' radio talks were central to her political participation in public citizenship, um, and through these speeches, her voice is, a, I guess, a sonic representation of her kind of maternally feminine body. Um, yet, it is important to emphasize that this is a white body. Um, it, you know, is not a kind of 
universal thing. Um, and it's not coincidental that Lyon's speaking style was um, a kind of performance of a white British ideal of femininity. Um, and as such, her role as a mother to the nation, speaking to the public through radio, um, reinforced exclusionary discourses of women's public citizenship um, by highlighting a white middle class ideal of who should occupy public space. During the 1946 election campaign, um, Lyons recorded a series of political advertisements for radio on topics related to the family, um, including rationing, social security and the housing crisis. In these broadcasts, she emphasised how these issues impacted upon the lives of women and in doing so reinforced the primacy of the home for the Liberal Party's voter base. For example, in one broadcast criticising the Gift Duty Act, which tax gifts over £500 in value, Lyons emphasised how this tax impacted upon family relations. Quote, Do you realise that no man may put the family home in his wife's name unless he is prepared to pay tax on its value? Already the difficulty of providing for many children serves to put dangerous limits upon the size of Australian families. How then can a tax be justified that adds still further to the burden? Through focusing on the family, Lyons promoted the Liberal Party's agenda of smaller government, reduced regulation, free market and private ownership. She also emphasised this worldview in another broadcast for the 1946 election in a more theoretical sense. Quote, we believe in personalised ownership against social ownership. It is part of a basic human need that people have possessions. A principal aim of the Liberal Party is to extend to all Australian people the means to achieve this end. Um, according to this rhetoric, reduced government interference in economic and social relations therefore benefit, benefited the middle class home and made for stronger, happier families. The centrality of women to this vision of government was implied in the focus on home and family. However, Lyons also explicitly addressed women through political broadcasts. In an undated script titled Women's Rights, she outlined the Liberal Party's commitment to boosting women's participation in public affairs and her own personal experience of the need for women's perspectives in policy development, including broadcasting policy. Quote, wireless programs too are very much the concern of women and these become more and more a matter of public policy. Whatever you do as women, don't think you have no interest in politics. Your vote, your vote is your weapon to use for better living. Lyon's point about radio programs demonstrates both the, imp both the importance of radio to women's lives and its centrality to political culture during this time. She inferred that women's interest in radio programming, demonstrated through their listening to that very broadcast, was in itself a political act. Dorothy Tangney had also broadcast for many years prior to her election in 1943, mostly in support of the Western Australian branch of the Labor Party. Um, in 1940, for example, she broadcast to some voters in Victoria in support of a candidate in, the fe in a federal by-election. Um, and in this broadcast, she emphasised the national unity of the Labor movement. Quote, we do not meet as West Australians and Victorians, but as fellow Labourites working for a common cause, the social betterment of all working people, the vast majority of Australians. However, when Tanya was elected to the Australian Senate in 1943, um, she shifted towards speaking more specifically to women through her broadcasts. During the 1943 election campaign, her broadcasts featured in early evening time slots discuss, and discuss more general issues, um, particularly regarding labor, the Labor government's leadership during wartime. Um, but after her election, the broadcasts then shifted um, and were predominantly heard on Western Australian stations at 11 a.m., which was a daytime slot targeted at women. These broadcasts focused on issues perceived to be of specific relevance to Western Australian women voters, um, and they featured titles like Women in Free Medicine and Women in Banking. Um, by 1949, therefore, um, Tangney was using radio to speak directly to women voters in her state. Tangney had stood for election three times prior to her eventual success in 1943, twice in the Parliament of Western Australia and once for the Australian Senate. She had been a member of the state executive of the Western Australian branch of the ALP for several years. Um, yet despite her relative seniority, she was positioned fourth on the Western Australian Senate ticket in the 43 election, um, which is generally considered to be unwinnable. Um, the landslide to the ALP at that election meant that she got over the line, but this wasn't just due to luck. Um, Tangney really campaigned hard and her approach resonated with voters. 
this included a prolific use of radio to canvas her message. Um, the Worker newspaper... Um, sorry. The Worker reported that Tangy had made uh, 60 broadcasts, which is quite a lot, throughout the 1943 election campaign. Um, it was also reported that she received good training for this oratorical marathon during her time as a school teacher in Perth, which would put her in good stead to handle the long-winded male senators that awaited her. Um, Tangy's experience as a teacher and her university education were often highlighted as evidence of her qualification for the position of senator. Um, teaching was an acceptable profession for women, um, I guess an alternative mothering role um, through which women raised the nation's children, um, and it also apparently gave women skills which could be called upon in parliamentary settings. Tangney was kind of often just seen to be a school matron coming in and instilling order on the unruly male senators um, in a similar way that Lyons was seen as a mother in the house. Tangney's relative youth at the time of her election, she was 36, um, was also emphasised as an asset. The Australian Women's Weekly stated in 1943 that while Lyons represented the older generation who have combined family life with an interest in public affairs, Tangney represented the younger generation, whose lives have been shattered by the economic stress of the decades between the two wars. Like so many of the thoughtful women of this period, she has become sharply aware of the way in which broad national and international problems affect everybody's life. Tangney was often represented in the media as a battler who had overcome adversity um, to make history. At the time of her election, it was widely reported that she was part of a large family who struggled by an meagre income and, had survived, and that she had survived beyond infancy despite her low birth weight. She was a bright, ambitious girl who began working at age 15 to supplement the family income, but worked hard to graduate from the University of Western Australia and to become a teacher. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, Tangis was a story of triumph, of courage, character and hard work over adversity. Tangney was unmarried and had no children, and as such it was difficult for her to embody the same ideal of maternal citizenship that Lyons did so effectively. Instead, Tangney adopted a position of a kind of professional ally for wives and mothers, one who would work tirelessly in support of their interests. Tangney always promoted the primacy of the maternal role for women, even though she campaigned strongly for equal pay and did not embody that role herself. In this way, she recognised that working was often a necessity for women, but motherhood was the ideal role, and the goal of policy making was to provide the conditions to make it possible for as many women as possible. Her policy priorities aligned with this view as she championed increased government expenditure on social security, housing, health and education. Tangney articulated this position in her broadcasts. In one undated post-war script, she addressed girls of school leaving age about the need for workers in the clothing trade. Tangney stated that a large number of women had left the clothing trade following the end of the war, which resulted in a serious shortage of personnel required to produce clothing for returning servicemen, many of whom had no choice but to continue wearing their uniforms. She acknowledged the stigma attached to factory work, such as clothing production, but then emphasised its practical benefits to women, both as a skill, which could be used after marriage, and as a secure career path, arguing that good needle women need have no fear for the future. Tangney clearly placed value on marriage and homemaking as the preferred life path for women, but recognised economic circumstances and the needs of industry often required women to work, and that wartime conditions continue to necessitate women's participation in the workforce. Tangney was also particularly concerned with the welfare of rural Western Australian women, who faced special hardships due to their isolation in a harsh environment. As the Adelaide Mail reported in August 1943, one of her strongest characteristics is a crusading spirit on behalf of country women living in marginal wheat areas whose conditions horrify her. In an undated script titled The Northwest, Tangney imparted her impressions on the vast northern outback of WA and the hardships faced by women in these isolated communities, noting that here the Northwest housewife is at a great disadvantage, not only for food, as she is unable to augment her rations from a delicatessen or a restaurant, but also the clothing position is very acute. Radio was of particular importance to rural Western Australian women during this time, um, as wartime newsprint restrictions virtually ceased the already patchy distribution of newspapers and magazines, um, while petrol rationing significantly impeded their ability to travel. 
radio became a crucial link to the outside world, and this placed special importance on broadcasts like those of Tangney. By broadcasting the experience of rural Western Australian women across the state, um, she gave them a voice in the public sphere. Tangney also sought to emphasise the importance of women to the labour movement more generally. In a broadcast about the Western Australian Labour Women's Conference in 1945, Tangney highlighted the outsized outsized role that Western Australian women had played in this regard. Since the dawn of the labour movement in Australia, women have done a magnificent job in pioneering work so essential to its progress. She then clearly outlined the policy priorities for ALP women in the post-war era, social security, employment, housing, education and health, um, and the importance of including women in the peace process was also emphasised. Quote, women have played their part nobly in the war, and we Labour women say they must have the same voice in the making of peace. Like Lyons, Tangney's election campaign broadcasts often focus on the impact of her party's policies on women. For example, in Women in Free Medicine, broadcast on Perth commercial station 6pm in November 1949, she explained the ALP's healthcare policies, which aim to reduce the cost burden of doctor's visits and medicines on families, while in 1946's broadcast to women, Tangney outlined what she had delivered for women during her three years in the Senate. Quote, I trust that you will show your appreciation by permitting the Labor government to continue its work for you and your children, permitting me as your direct representative to continue to advise the government on matters pertaining to your welfare. So according to Tangney, uh, a female presence in Parliament had resulted in tangible benefits to women's lives, and voting for a woman would ensure that women's concerns would continue to have a central place in government priorities. Tangney also promoted Labor's pro-women policies through her broadcasts. A broadcast on the 1946 social services referendum, um, she urged women to vote yes, as the ALP had shown its honesty, ha shown its honesty of purpose in raising your endowment, and will assist you further in giving you real and not imaginary benefits. In 1949, Tagney broadcast on a Perth commercial station in support of the government's proposed bank nationalisation, and she argued that the wives and farmers, wives of farmers in Western Australia, have a very deep personal knowledge of the destructive potential of private banks, which forced many families off their land during the Great Depression. Tangney's political rhetoric emphasised the importance of women's lived experiences to policy development. So I also have a recording of Tagney from the same session with the ABC. And I'll play you a little bit. I realise the great honour which has been done to me in affording me the opportunity to move this address and reply. I also realise my great honour in being the first woman to be elected to the Senate. But it is not as a woman that I have been elected to this chamber. It is as a citizen of the Commonwealth. And I take my place here with the full privileges and rights of all honourable senators. And what is still more important, with the full responsibilities which such a high office entails. In this recording, Tangney uses, again, a kind of medium high pitch. Um, it, it's still a received Australian accent. Um, she speaks, I think, a bit more quickly than Lyons, and her sentences can sound quite flat until she intones down at the end of the sentence. Um, but she has a clear and practised voice. She doesn't stumble, um, even if the recording maybe sounds a bit like she's recording off a page, rather than the more intimate conversation that you can hear in Lyons' speech. Um, so perhaps Tangney doesn't exhibit the same skill as Lyons, but I think she does sound very clear and practice. Um, and like Lyons, her speaking style was um, praised by the press. Uh, following her maiden speech, um, the Canberra Times stated that she spoke confidently and did not portray the nervousness to which she afterwards confessed. Uh, the worker described her as a cultured speaker, energetic and good humoured. Um, and in 1944, it was reported of a speech she gave in Adelaide Quote, Miss Tangney has a well-controlled voice, whereas three men who spoke before her used a microphone and amplifying system to carry their voices to the large audience. She put these aside and the audience did not miss a word. Once again, these descriptions show that the use of a cultured, well-controlled voice was a crucial condition to being accepted um, as a parliamentarian in the 1940s, especially for a woman. 
Tagney was perceived to be an excellent public speaker, which helped, her, which helped to present her as a competent legislator. By the 1943 election, radio had been established as a medium through which women had been claiming their voice as politically engaged citizens for close to two decades. By appealing to women through broadcasts, female parliamentarians address women within a space that they were already using to participate in public discourse and expanded this to include formal politics. In doing so, they employed rhetoric which emphasised the home and family as the primary political concern of women, but which also required informed and active citizenship. This is notable when placed in the context of the differing approaches of labour um, and non-labour politics. Um, Lyon's rhetorical focus on the nation's value lying in the homes of its people fitted in well with the broader political message of the UAP slash Liberal Party at this time. The messaging was a bit trickier for labour women who had to adopt a similar rhetoric to appeal to women voters and to legitimise their own position as political candidates while the broader messaging of the party was very much focused on industrial relations and primarily male experiences and needs. Furthermore, public speaking was seen as an important prerequisite for a political career, and thus by demonstrating their skills through broadcasts, these women established their legitimacy and authority as political representatives. In particular, Lyons and Tangney's use of ideal speech styles worked to position them as competent orat orators and thus competent legislators. Thank you. Sitting here thinking about the, um, I don't know, the forgotten people, the rhetoric and the focus on the home as the centre of the middle class, yeah. and I'm thinking the 40s influence of America, the importance of cultural voices, it was the key technology of modernity, and then I think of 2022, what's the significant, you know, what, what's the corollary of this? Is it social media? Is it what is the voice of the people or these powerful people now? Um, th yeah. It's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. I definitely think um, social media has probably inherited some of that, but it's, it's such a different medium. It's much more democratic. You know, radio, yeah. you had to be invited to speak. You had to conform to certain ideas. You had to have a script and all of this sort of stuff. It was... Um, yeah, much more elitist, whereas social media, anybody can jump on Twitter or whatever yeah. and, you know, <laughs> give their opinions. Please. So, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, we've seen social media be used in political movements like Me Too and, um, yeah. you know, all those sorts of things as well. So I think there is a kind of a line to be drawn there, but they're very different contexts. Yeah. They are, yeah. I mean, these were extraordinary women yes. in unbelievable times. Yeah, they, exactly. they, you know... Just extraordinary. Um, that was fascinating. Thank you. Oh, that was absolutely well. great. So, who's got some questions here? They're stunned. Yes. Uh, so if you were a woman or really any parliamentarian wanting to see collection, radio was, was the medium. Um, you would be giving talks like this and outlining your policies. Um, another woman I look at in the book is Jessie Street, um, who stood for election several times and wasn't successful. Um, she also gave a lot of um, broadcasts and things like that, um, very kind of similar topics. She's probably a bit less focused on maternal femininity, a bit more kind of equality and role of women in international affairs and things like that but um, definitely most of the the women who were in say the women for Canberra movement as well were trained um, to broadcast so I think there's a quote I remember that said you know orantry rent the air um, in this kind of period because you know these women part of the, their training to be effective candidates was to be trained to be broadcasters um, and that was a really key part of campaigning at that time. Mm -hmm. It still happens now. Mm. Oh, yeah. 
Very well known broadcaster. Got a text message from someone two weeks ago telling her voice was shrill and she was in for an addiction. So that, addiction. that stuff is still happening now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, so women were, had lots of different roles. So advertisements is one. Um, they hosted, you know, kind of variety type shows, women's sessions, children's sessions. Um, a lot of women as well in different, not looking to be political candidates, but politically engaged in other ways. So um, focused on, say, the international kind of peace process or other topics would give talks um, as well. Um, and yeah, so some women as well, I've looked at um, Irene Greenwood in Western Australia is a key one, but they were able to kind of use their women's sessions, which were meant to be kind of, yeah, focused on kind of wifely duties or whatever, um, and were able to kind of sneak in some quite um, political messaging. So Irene Greenwood was able to, to sneak in some quite um, pro-communist party messaging into her women's session, which was pretty um, remarkable. And I think part of that is because it was a women's session and didn't have the scrutiny placed on it um, by as much as, say, other sessions would have that she was able to kind of get away with it. Um, and, but yes, um, women were, were doing broadcasts on, on lots of different topics um, and it was really considered to be kind of this amazing medium that really could, um, you know, make women's status just, you know, so much better and, you know, we really need to grab hold of this and, um, yeah, and run with it. Um, so there are women that broadcast in prime time, Damien being a key one um, because she is such a remarkable person and all of that. Um, so you do get them in prime time, just not as much as men. Um, and I mean, it's, it's difficult because by kind of the 1950s, television starts to become more of a thing. And then this kind of talk, you know, giving a kind of lecture on radio really starts to fall out of fashion. and. So you kind of don't, I guess, get them in the same way uh, just because of the change of the medium. But there, there definitely are women in broadcasting in prime time, just not as many. I think one of the, um, <laughs> one of the comments I enjoyed most was um, Damien and Lyons was the sonic ideal of the female parliamentarian. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Look, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, if you'd like to, everyone to thank Dr. Catherine Fisher. I have. And I hope you're terribly impressed with this. <laughs> it's a small gift to oh, thank, thank you. you. For your, uh, oh, that's beautiful. For your session thank this you. Evening. Thank you so much. Uh, before you leave this evening, I'd just like to say this is. Um, as uh, Mr. Speaker has said, this is one of a, a range of programs that we run. The next one could be very interesting during these times. It's a, a Parliament Unpacked session. It'll be on the 6th of June. And it's who are the whips and what do they do? Um, so it's in forces of discipline and the role of the party whip. Um, and it's part of our Parliament Unpacked program. You'll have the opportunity to meet the whips and their role is actually, among other things, is to uphold party discipline. It'll be a panel including government and opposition whips who'll share their experience of communicating and enforcing party positions, organising business of the House and working together with other parties. And you'll also hear from the crossbench who actually don't have formal whips but have other, you know, adopted other ways of getting people to vote the way they want to vote or to do what they want to. So that could be quite fascinating. 6th of June. Um, hope to see you back here. And thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.